Welcome to the Addiction Connection, bringing the hope of the gospel to the heart of addiction. My name is Jim Quigley, and I'm filling in today for Mark Shaw, and I have my co-host there, CJ McMurray. Say hi, CJ. Hey, how you doing? Great to be on here. And we are joined today all the way from Dublin, Georgia, with our good friend, West Pinkley. Hey, gang. Good to see y'all. Thanks for being here, Wes. And you told us right before the show that there's an interesting relation to your last name, Pinkley, which we had quite a bit of fun talking about uh, different things we could say about your last name. But tell us what it's related to, my friend. Well, it's uh, actually related to back in the days of merry old England of creating swords. Pinking has to do with uh, tempering and building swords. You've probably heard of pinking shears, which were for cutting. Uh, basically, it has a lot to do with sword craftsmanship. Wow. And Wes needs to be a uh, a uh, craftsman or a skilled swordsman. We, we were saying that he needs to wield a double-edged sword often because he is the senior pastor. Why don't you tell everybody uh, where you pastor and the exciting um, celebration coming up for you? Yeah, uh, I am the pastor of Poplar Springs North Baptist Church, and we are about to celebrate our 215th anniversary. We no longer have any original members with us, but we have several good ones. Um, And we are in Dublin, Georgia, and the town right next to us is East Dublin, which is quite famous in the world of golf because that is where they cut the fabric and get ready to make the jackets for the Masters Golf Tournament winners. Wow. Wow. The green, the green color jackets. The coveted green jacket. Yes, which go along well with the, the name Dublin and, and probably the large Irish population, I'm guessing, or maybe not. <laughs> Everybody's Irish around here or during March. All right, yeah. Every, everybody is Irish on uh, St. Patrick's Day, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. true. Yeah, that's right. So, um, uh, uh, beyond, besides being a, a senior pastor, uh, uh, I first met Wes um, in doing some CABC. That's when we first met, right? When we teamed up together to do a CABC or... We had done that, but I believe we had met each other at one of the Addiction Connection conferences... Okay. That we have every November. I believe I was summit. at the second summit, and that's where we met. I think we were in a small group together. That's right. And uh, why don't you tell everybody a little bit uh, about your interest in being a part of the Dick Connection um, generally and then uh, and more broadly in biblical counseling? All right. As uh, part of biblical counseling, Uh, I love being certified. I've been certified through ACBC and IABC, and I hope everybody's familiar with those acronyms. But uh, in studying, quite often I'd go to these conferences, and guess who would have one of the most interesting classes? It would be Mark Shaw. And I I attended several of his. And then when this uh, certification with, with the Addiction Connection came up, it really appealed to what I was dealing with because I was in a community where there was a lot of drug addiction and there were people struggling with, with uh, a multitude of things and looking over the curriculum and attending one of the conferences, I really believed that this was an avenue that to be able to, be able to better minister to uh, the people in my community and my church, it'd be most helpful to dive in depth into this discipleship to get a better understanding of it and to be able to make that available to those that come through the doors. But wait a second, wait a second. Am I hearing that you, you've never struggled personally with drugs and alcohol? How can you possibly help anybody, Wes? Well, I I believe that uh, we all struggle with different things. It might not be drugs or alcohol. Uh, It could be anger, could be gossip, could be any number of things. But also, uh, I'm called to be a shepherd. And I don't necessarily, I believe for counselors, we don't necessarily have to have gone down the hard road, but we can go through the road of scripture. And I like what uh, David Tyler once said to me. He said, if sin is the problem, Jesus is the answer. Amen. Amen. And so I, I love discipleship. 
I, I'm, I'm a Bible geek and I love to dig in. And there's so much truth in scripture that will help people. And I find a lot of people, they go to, they might've gone to church as a kid and maybe in their teens and they've fallen away and they've got all these Bible things floating around up here, like pieces of a puzzle. And they've never had anybody help them put the big picture together. And so I love to sit down with people, open up the scriptures and let the Holy Spirit work by helping them, you know, put the border around the picture or maybe hold up the box and say, this is what it ought to look like. How do we get here? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, I've not, I've not had those addictions, but I love people. I think God is a God of grace. And what a lot of people struggling with is they just need somebody to give them some grace and direction and love. Good. You know, I said that sarcastically. Um, how can you, and you guys knew that. It is your it kinda, second language. It's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a good segue into what we had discussed before um, about what we would might want to talk about. And I uh, just want to read Colossians 2.8. Um, it says, Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit, according to the to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And uh, we had decided before uh, the show that we wanted to talk about um, our personally how we have bought into some some human traditions and empty deceit and whatnot in our own experience and uh how the lord brought us from that where we're at today and that is a perfect example of something that i that i detest um when it comes to human tradition i don't know how many how many times have you guys heard it like there's no no nothing that someone that has not experienced it and we'll just take we'll just go more general like if you haven't experienced fill in the blank, then you can't speak into somebody that's struggling with that thing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, it's a total lie. It's an absolute lie because my experience is not what's going to transform somebody's heart, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. And uh, who is the best one that uh, that has been able to diagnose people's experiences is, is, is God in scripture mm -hmm. um, and also give us uh, pathways to change, which is also... Uh, scripture and the 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 the, the life giving Holy Spirit that indwells us. But um, specifically, mm -hmm. uh, does anything come to mind with you uh, about um, something that you once found yourself operating in and realized this is not truth, and you were delivered from it or brought from that, and now um, it's impacting your life? Uh, that experience and impacting your life in a positive way for the kingdom. You want me to go or CJ? We want Wes. All right. Well, as, as little as we can need to hear from CJ, you know, I mean, <laughs> honestly. All right. Well, uh, Jim, yeah. honestly, you hear that? Wow, pain. There is counseling available. I feel the love. Um, I can <laughs> remember I had, I was in my 20s and had just become a Christian, was at a secular university and sitting in a psychology class of about 400 people. Mm. And the teacher was really good. Um, really enjoyed learning from him, but he kept going on about these different theories. He kept going on about Freud and Maslow and all these other, I'm more of a Pavlov kind of guy. I hear a dinner bell, I'm ready. Um, and I remember listening to all this and they never would address sin. It was always your mom's fault, your dad's fault, your childhood's fault, your economic fault, your needs fault. And you could shift the blame to anything. And I thought, this isn't right. And, and so that thought just kind of what I call crock potted. It sat in the back of my mind on a slow cooker for a while. For a long time, I, I just didn't think about it. But I knew that there was something wrong about that, that philosophy. And long story short, I remember uh, pastoring a church. And I had a couple come to me where... They sat down in the living room of my home and she had committed adultery that week with a neighbor. Mm. And the husband, they wanted to fix the marriage. They came to me and I had absolutely no clue what to do. Um, I didn't know where to begin, but the long story short is that led me on the road 
to discovering biblical counseling. And in that, I remember sitting in a class, and that's where uh, David Tyler from, uh, he was down there in Fairview Heights, Illinois, he's with IABC, he was teaching a class, and I was there, and he said, if sin is the problem, Christ is the cure. And I realized that's the answer that I've been looking for ever since that psychology class. And he used that same verse that you were talking about. Mm. And I was working through that, and, and I thought, this is exactly the truth. And so I've based my counseling off of that. I've based my counseling off of that if sin is your problem, Jesus who suffered like us so he could be identified with us can save us. And I would want to help people understand their life, their emotions, their heart, their thinking in light of scripture. Because truly, if, if uh, sin is the problem, then Christ is the cure. Mm. And and Dave Tyler's not the only one that said that, but he's the first one I said it, and he really taught me to start thinking from a biblical perspective on on that uh, situation. I'm staring at you. Can you feel me burning holes at you through your glasses, CJ? Are you wanting me to go? I get to go now. We're going to allow you a few minutes. I may have okay. to cut you. All right, off. and then you blow the air horn when my time's up. Well, hey, so I wanted. To, I was curious, Wes. Uh, what kind of grade did you make in that class, or did you did you start in any problems over there? Um, are the the secular psychology class or the one with IABC? Uh, the secular psychology class. Um, oh, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. I can't. <laughs> <see that. laughs> we kind of figured. Four hundred people, man. That's a lot of people in a class. Yeah, it was a it was a big auditorium. Yeah, it was easy to hide. <laughs> Yeah, it's about how many people are the whole undergraduate uh, um, uh, program uh, at my undergrad. So, mm. so yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll have. To, so for me, um, I from a young age, I mean, I was brought up. I grew up kind of broken home. I grew up around addictions. Most of my family uh, struggled with whether it be drugs or alcohol. And I just, I think, even before I ever struggled with you know, started using drugs or alcohol, I had been, because my mom had been through uh, different 12-step programs in the, you know, I suppose late 80s and early 90s, uh, it was all about like 12 steps. And she started going to NAAA stuff and Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. And I just remember like hearing from, you know, I mean, I think I probably knew by the time I was 12 or 13 that I had bought into the, the idea that alcohol and drug addiction was a disease. Um, you know, it was, it was something that they, they couldn't, uh, you know, it was like, what is a, a compulsive, compulsive disorder, you know, like they just couldn't help it. And, and I remember, so I just thought, well, and I, and then once I started using it, started going down that road, I thought, well, this is just kind of my destiny. You know, I was brought up around it. I'm a product of my environment and I just kept on going and, reaped a lot of just destruction and in and out of jails and treatment centers and all those kind of things. And so I bought in and I think a lot of it, it was an easy, it was an easy out for me. Cause I didn't, that way I didn't have to take ownership. Mm-hmm. I, I would use that to kind of, you know, for me, I just can't help it. You know, this is who I am. And, but there was always this part of me that, you know, and I didn't believe at that point. And I believed in God as a creator. I believe there was something but I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, definitely hadn't humbled, you know, humbled myself before him. And uh, so I bought into that model. It was a disease and, and you could only cope with it for the rest of your life. You could go to, you know, you had to go to meetings and you had to stay plugged into that system and work the steps and all these things, which I never really got much traction. The times that I did go through programs, I mean, I just, went through the programs to go through the motions. And I don't think I ever actually worked the steps the way they told me to, Mm -hmm. uh, because I would just continue going back to the same old stuff over and over again. But then nothing changed for me until I got saved, until I was born again in April of 2004. And I started to read the Bible. And I remember coming across scriptures like, like the one you shared in Colossians 2. Uh, Another one that really got me was 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 where it says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, 
for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, this is either true or it's a lie. I mean, it's mm-hmm. one of if it's true, then it's saying that everything in this book, everything in this Bible is enough. Like it's sufficient. It's sufficient for any problem under the sun. And that includes addiction. And the other one, and I'll, I'll shut up here quick, pretty quick, Jim. You got a couple minutes. You got a couple minutes. minutes. (laughs) See what happens when he runs the show, Wes? (laughs) Commercial work. (laughs) So the other scripture is Romans chapter one. Uh, And, and this one was another one that uh, just, and I thought about when we get to it here, I should have had that bookmark. Romans 1, uh, verses 16 and 17, where the apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And here, I mean, it's telling us that like Paul, he's saying, and we know like the apostle Paul, before he was persecuting Christians, he was a part of putting them to death. And he was definitely not, and, and a, but he was changed by the gospel and it flipped his whole world upside down. Everything, all his, all the things that he thought he believed, all the things that he was passionate about, just totally got flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. And it says that the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So to me, when I take those two scriptures and I think about it in light of addictions, like 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, just tells us that God's word is completely sufficient. And Romans 1, 16 and 17, and there's many others in in scripture that tell us that the power of the gospel is, is, there's nothing, there's nothing that it cannot penetrate. There's nothing that it cannot, like, it, it takes you from death to life. There's nothing that, like, when it changes you, when it starts, when, when it affects a person, when somebody becomes born again, every part of their life becomes change, yeah. changes. Now, it, it's a process. I understand that. Transformation, we're, we're changed from one degree of glory to another. But, uh, I mean, it, it just, and I remember, again, I had to, re- I read lots of books, I I remember I used to, I was really frustrated even clear up to probably 2014 or 15. And I was like, how come none of the guys that I respect hardly write about addictions? I just couldn't find anything from Piper, MacArthur, any of those guys, even though later I found when you start using biblical language, a lot of the stuff they write about, even the old school Puritans, you know, you think of John Owen and mortification of sin. He did talk about it. He just didn't talk about it. He used biblical, they, most people use biblical language, mm. but I stumbled into some of Mark Shaw and Ed Welch's stuff. Yeah. And that's when I started to be like, yes, these, you know, and then I met Mark and then little by little, uh, it just, I was like, okay, these are my people. And I got connected through the addiction in action. And now here we are, you know, started a residential program and who knows where else we're going to, you know, it's just been, it's been an amazing, but I had to. I had to go. I believed a lot of bad. I, I had a lot of bad ideas before. Mm. But I was captured by the philosophies philosophies of this world. Mm. So, go ahead, Jim. What about you? No, oh, thanks, CJ. Um, I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna mention something that we're all very familiar with, and I always have to be careful because people think that I have a vendetta against twelve step programs when I start talking about them. But they're just a real legitimate part of my story. And in in my experience, and and just hear me out. I grew up in church. I grew up at Christian school. Um, I had you know parents. My parents divorced, but you know they they did the best they could. I mean, I would just say that I put in quotation marks. I had a fairly normal childhood, you know. I mean, and uh, my parents did what they, they could to provide for us the best they could. And uh, so there's not really any kind of strong influence, I think, from my family or anything um, that I can look on as a negative. There was a a lot of positive, actually. What I had learned about uh, about God and Jesus and all of those things, uh, you know, I really didn't have anybody mentoring me or discipling me. It was just what I had picked up, you know, at vacation Bible schools or at church or Sunday school and things like that, um, which was more than the average person, you know. 
But uh, if you've ever heard about those people that 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 kept asking Jesus into their heart, that was me. I had done that. I don't know how many times, you know, I don't know how many times, but I eventually drifted off into a path of progressive, significant substance abuse around 13, progressed until 24. And then at 24, I had this like a lot of stuff happen all at once. Like I had this kind of like I got arrested. I was hopeless. I my church reached out to me and I caught some hope and I started going back to church. And at the same time, I started going to AA meetings. Actually, my first AA meeting wasn't even a decision. I went to go support somebody else that was trying to save their job. Mm. And they asked me to go with them. I didn't have no idea where we were going. We went and I just went. Mm. And uh, I ended up going back to that AA meeting by myself the next week. And uh, I just, I, I picked up a white chip and I stayed sober for six years. And it was it was a really amazing experience for me. Up to this point, again, I only knew what I knew about God from what I had picked up along the way. Not any, not because anybody was sitting and discipling me on a one-on-one basis. It was just stuff that I had kind of gathered. So AA was interesting because they talked about God, you know, yeah. and I could, I could plug in my elementary knowledge about God to this system because they were talking about God, even though most of the people didn't believe in the same God I believed in at this place. It didn't matter, right, to me in that moment. And so I thrived in AA because um, it was very clear cut on what I needed to do in order to get to God, right? So I did all those things, and I was cheered the whole way along, right? Cheered the whole way along. And then I, after two years of that, I ended up going to deciding I wanted to go into ministry because I was I was going to my AA meetings and then I would go to church and I just loved showing up and doing what people told me to do at both places. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I got a lot of positive attention and it was great. It was it was was addicting in a way. You know, I love getting encouragement like, hey, you're doing great. So then I go, I was like, hey, I want to go into ministry because this God that I found in AA, um, uh, I want to talk, talk more people about it. I obviously need an education. So I, I went to Bible college. I started to, to thrive there in something I never thought I could do. That's actually where I started to separate from AA. Um, I started to be like, well, I've gotten all I'm going to get out of it. You know, I mean, I've done the steps. I've found the spiritual awakening. Um, I'm not... I'm not telling other people about it like they tell you to in the last step, continue to pass it on within the context of AA, but I am telling people about God. So I'm kind of doing it, but just in a different context. And that's what I would tell myself, you know, but the thing was, is I wasn't telling people about the God of the Bible, which was a God that says, apart from me, you could do nothing. You need me for everything. Yeah. Um, your obedience and works are not going to get you to me. I was teaching them a God I had learned primarily from AA, which was a God that was there as long as you did what you needed to do to get to him. Right. And it's a little G, God of your own understanding, right? Yeah. And I had mixed this in. And obviously, I relapsed. Um, uh, if you've ever heard, uh, after I graduated Bob College, I was 30 years old when I relapsed. And I stayed in a relapse for five very long years and um, and uh, almost died. And looking back on it all, I can say, hey, you know what? The people I met in AA for the, for the most part were just really nice people, very genuine, wanted to help me out. But what I learned, which was, which was basically legalism, um, and I brought that into to my understanding of Christianity, why isn't it true that AA taught me that? Why is that not true? Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I've never been had anybody be able to tell me that. They always tell me I'm just, you know what, that was your experience that and I've actually I actually go back and I've looked, I've studied the big book and I've and I've wondered why isn't it that that's exactly what it teaches? That it, it literally teaches you that you can get to God by doing these things Mm -hmm. and why does that not 
lead to a sense of pride where I did it. So why aren't other people doing it? If I did it, they can do it. Shame on them for not doing it, you know, mm-hmm. which honestly is what I, happened to me. That's why I, I kept going further and further away from wanting to be a part of a, but people would always say like these mystical things to me, like keep coming back and you just, you don't truly understand. I'm like, well, I'm asking you to explain it to me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, explain it to me how I don't understand because I want to understand. And, you know, wow. over the years now, again, I'm not trying to beat up on AA and stuff like that, but man, that was a, that was a hard thing. I mean, I was, I was literally trapped in that type of thinking for a very long time to where I literally would start feeling these, these immense guilty feelings that I wasn't going to meetings, you know, that like, like I would feel mm. this impending doom that something bad really was going to happen. Um, even after I came up here to Freedom Farm in my first couple of years in, I'd get this little gnawing thing back in my mind. And I would, I would think that something bad, the shoe was going to drop any day now because I was not part of that anymore. Mm. And, and, and it took even longer to say that, Hey, maybe that stuff's actually not good, you know? And I still get ridiculed today. I mean, uh, there's plenty of guys in this program that, that love AA. And if I were to say anything negative about it, they think I'm, you know, I'm not being a good Christian because they're, they're just really good people trying to help people where yeah. essentially that is, that's true. They're well, no, there are no good people. <laughs> so yeah. they, are pe- they are people trying to help people. Right. But, you know, I, I, I often use an illustration to people in, in a Christian context. I say, Hey, look, if you had a disciple some of your disciples and come up to you and say, Hey, I met this group of people. They're talking about Jesus every day. Um, they're really encouraging me to, to live an obedient life. And it's, it's really good. They're really welcoming. Um, they're, they're, they're really, uh, helping me out. I'm, I'm really loving this group that I talked to. I wanted to ask your opinion. What do you, what do you think about it? I figured it was okay because they're talking about Jesus. And you said, well, like, uh, well, what's the name of the place? And I'm like, well, it's it's the Church of Latter Day Saints down the street here. You know, as a Christian, you would say, get the heck out of that place. Mm-hmm. That place is toxic and terrible. And I were to say, but but hey, wait, wait, they talk about Jesus and 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 they say we're Christians. I mean, you know, what's wrong? And they're good. I mean, they they tell me not to drink caffeine and tell me not to. I mean, I'm really. Amen. I'm really feeling healthy and all this stuff. Like what's wrong with that? Mm-hmm. You know, people can, it, Christians can see what's really wrong with that, mm-hmm. but there's like this problem. A lot of times the majority of people saying that that 12 step stuff, that, you know, there's no really harm in it. You know, it's, it's actually pretty encouraging to people and it helps out a lot of people. And I just don't, don't see it that way anymore. I think I rightly learned how to be a legalistic Christian in AA I think it's what I learned mm-hmm. by mixing Christianity and the 12 steps. So. Well, Wes, I want to hear your thoughts a little bit. And then I have so, a little something I want to say about, about that, just kind of to go off the heels of what you're saying, Jim. Wes, do you have something? Yeah, I, I think Jim's made a really good point because if you have all these steps that they say you need to do, these disciplines, it's very easy to be prideful at the end um, and get to the end. You know, some people talk about self-esteem. Well, my question always is, is where does self-esteem leave off and pride begin? Mm-hmm. And they're really right. one and the same thing. They're just a different label. One is said to be good, but you can build up a legalism and I, I look at that and it's 12 steps. You have, what if you slip up on two or three within, well, you know, you got to start all over again. Um, I love the fact that Christ steps toward us Amen. and that Amen. there's grace. And uh, I love being able to be a purveyor of grace. We might put that on my tombstone that uh, people need to know that, that God is a loving God. He doesn't tolerate sin. But when we teach about him being holy, 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 that gives an absolute wonder of Jesus was coming to make you holy. 
and you can't do it on your own. And I love pushing the beauty and wonder of what Christ has done and what the Holy Spirit is doing. I want us to not look at other people as a, I've accomplished this and you haven't, I'm better than you. But God works in us to say, you know what? We're all sinners. Like you said a minute ago, no one's good. Right. And and let us be pulling the planks out of our eyes before the speck in somebody else's and learn to show grace. And uh, that that's one thing I love about being a pastor is a lot of people have grown up under a bunch of sermons that are to-do list in and of themselves. Right. Do these seven steps and have a wonderful marriage. Be single, but follow these three things. And I want to introduce them to a God of grace, if, if that helps answer the question. That's great. No, that's that's spot on. And you know what? I just, my, like, and I'm not going to, I don't want to just to turn into, but I think we all, this is just our stories and how we ended up here. And it's different. We all have kind of different stories, but, but Jim and I are similar in the sense that we did buy into the 12 step kind of pro because that's what most of the world was teaching and most of the programs that we were going through were teaching us and so I remember though like when I started to come out of that and I came to know Christ I started to get really like the thing that bothered me the most is that you can get so you can go through I've seen guys I mean I've seen guys go through the program and never come to know Christ Mm -hmm. and get their lives straightened out get sober, get, have some success in life and, you know, get married, have a family. They're doing well. And, and that's great. I'm glad they're sober and they're, but they still don't know Jesus. Yeah. And they still don't know Jesus. And if we get, if you get your whole life straightened up and you still, and you still go to hell, that bothers me. And that's the thing. The 12 step program doesn't like, Point you to that reality that you're a sinner in need of a savior. Mm-hmm. That's the primary issue. You know, I, I think it was John MacArthur had said something, and I think it was a, a word play on Joel Olstein's book, Your Best Life Now. Mm-hmm. He said, if you're living your best life now, MacArthur said, you're going to hell. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and if that's what we do, if we get cleaned up on this side of eternity, get everything cleaned up and we're still going to hell, we've missed it. Mm-hmm. Like that, that, that just breaks my heart. So to me, and that's the, where, where Jesus and God's word, not only can you get sober and that's mm-hmm. only a part of it, but you, you get transformed. You get radically changed from the inside out. You, when you repent and believe the gospel, you are raised from death, death to life and you, and eternity is at stake. And I think it's eternity, absolutely important when we talk to people about if they're a Christian, if they're saved, that it's not a ticket to heaven because when Jesus says he came to give life and life more abundantly, that it begins now. I always tell people, when does eternal life begin? The minute you get saved and immediately you have that abundant life in Christ. Now we need to learn, right? Just like learning to ride a bicycle. You, you fall off a few times and you got the training wheels. Uh, But every day can be a fantastic adventure that we can wake up and just say, what is God going to do now? And we're putting off the old. And in the process of putting off the old, we're putting on the new. And, and we grab that Bible verse or or maybe sometimes it's just a song with good theology in it. And we're going through the day and we're just seeing every good and perfect gift is from the Father. Look, this was good. That was good. And, and we learn that, wow, I'm going through suffering. I'm about to teach through uh, the book of Job here in a couple of weeks, begin that. And we get through suffering. And even though we don't understand it, we can learn who the God is that's protecting us. So there's so much real goodness that can come out of when we're relying on him. Yeah, I mean, just a final uh, final uh, thought. Uh, You know, I often tell people that uh, we make terrible saviors. Mm -hmm. And and I honestly believe that that my trying to mix AA and Christianity basically just, I learned to try to be my own savior. No wonder I crashed and burned. But I want to say that there are people that are close to and part of the addiction connection that see a mission field within the people of that are in 12-step groups mm-hmm. and are, and are li- literally taking the, the time to patiently walk people through 
those steps as a starting point and to basically dissect them in such a way where they teach them how the 12 steps fall short and they need Christ. Amen. So I don't want any of those people to feel alienated right. um, from this podcast because, um, you know, all the people keep evangelizing. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Amen. Amen. It's a good word. Colossians 2 9, or to let just that very first see to it. You have to see to it that that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the mm-hmm. human tradition, according mm-hmm. to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So that means it's not just 12 steps. There's a lot of things. Yeah, there are yeah. so many things. We could have we could have talked about half a dozen or more yeah. uh, systems. And, and we did, because even in the church, there's legal. I mean, legalism is in and outside the church. Mm-hmm. Just the it becomes very easy to go to law and make a list of things you got to be doing. Yes. Uh, yep. Um, but I think the disciple life, the abundant life, is we're not going to get all our ducks in a row. We won't even know where our ducks are. But to, with the intention of the heart, just cry out to God saying, God, get me through this day. Open my eyes that I could see what you're already doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like what you were talking about from the Colossians verse, because see to it times into Romans 12, where it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yep. Well, one of the ways I renew my mind is I start looking for for what could God be doing? Whose life is God working in? Uh, I should be thankful for this. I spent time with one of our widows yesterday and just, just spent some time with her and saw God coming out of her conversation. And uh, just even now, I hear these things and it reminds me uh, of grace and to be thankful and to encourage others to persevere. Amen. You know, um, uh, on coming out of it, uh, you know, I don't want people to hear that when I relapsed, that's when I realized I had all this problem. No, when I started to study the word and get actually discipled, Mm. I was able to see how all this unfolded. And we could have a whole podcast on this, but I want to say that that your average person in 12-step meetings and your average person that that identifies as a Christian, both um, uh, uh, have uh, the same issue in not knowing what it is that their that their worldviews teach. Mm-hmm. Because because my experience isn't the average experience in um, in AA, but I truly learned it and tried to live it out. Right, and it wasn't until I learned truly what the the Bible said about living the Christian life um, that I realized I had learned wrong over here. Mm. If that, if that makes any sense, basically all to tell you that um, all the people that cheered me along that were Christians that said, Oh, this is so great that you're an AA. They're really just ignorant of both how God says uh, we live and what AA teaches. And uh, ignorance is probably a, uh, the biggest problem that exists, I know within the church, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure Wes could probably talk a lot about that. Well, maybe you have a very, very, um, uh, uh, well-read and, 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 uh, uh, gospel focused congregation. So I shouldn't say that, but, uh, mm-hmm. I know I hear from a lot of pastors that they get so frustrated because it's like their people don't even read their Bibles. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I'm telling you some basic ABCs here that you should know, you know? Yeah. So I could say I got a pretty solid congregation. Um, we have a lot of school teachers in our church that have actually taken that that love for teaching and learning and then apply it to the scriptures. And we've got just solid people all over the place. They keep me on my toes. Amen. But there, but you know, if you think about it, and I won't prolong this, they say most people after finishing high school never read another book. And usually during high school, they're only reading cliff notes to pass the, the test to get done with it. So they're not really reading. And so I think with what we're doing, if if God would work through us, may it give people a passion to get into the word 
to feed that hunger that's of the soul. I mean, think about it. addictions is, is a worship problem, trying to feed the hunger of the soul, going to worldly methods because that's all they've known. And if we can give them, I love the scripture, taste and see. I also love the one that says, arise, kill and eat because I'm a very food driven person. But if we can help people taste and see that the Lord is good, they'll follow suit. They'll say, I want this because nothing else satisfies. Boom. Amen. Amen. That's the best way to wrap up, isn't it, Jim? Yeah, definitely. I was about to say the same thing. You took the words out of my mouth, CJ. And it's very rare that you and I are both on the same wavelength. You know? <laughs> that is dangerous. <laughs> Wes, thanks so much for, for yeah. joining us. Looking forward to seeing you. You're going to be at a summit, right? The the plans right now, Lord willing, uh, I'm going to be up there and enjoying the whole thing. I mean, with Brad Bigney speaking, I, I, I love him. He's a wonderful teacher and i'm just looking forward to the whole thing i missed last year due to covid and some right. complications but it's a family affair and it's like every year we add new family members amen and, yeah. and you look around and there's young couples coming in and just it it's exciting yes yeah, yeah. yes indeed. well i'm excited too i'm gonna see if i can convince my family to come but all right my friends my brothers all right guys yeah it's been good to talk to you all and and yeah, who knows, yeah. we might podcast again before the summit. That'd be we fun. Might. It was fun to see you and be with you. Yeah, and, it really uh, is. We'll see you again soon. That'd yeah. be fun. But just give me a holler. Right. Y'all take care. Lot, you did the nervous, <laughs> what do I do with my hands? Hey, <laughs> see you later. Hey, if it's not you, it's me. It's just how it goes. Thanks, Bye. man. See you. Jim, take her easy, bro. Later, brother. Let me give you, let me give you the awkward way to keep going. Bye. Take care. God bless you guys.